Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, today we are in Acts chapter 13, verse 44, through chapter 14, verse 7. It sounds like a lot, but it's really only 16 verses that we're talking about today. And Chris, is there a PowerPoint? Perfect. All right, so just one slide again. It's just the map. This is where we've been traveling with Paul and Barnabas over the last couple of months. Uh, we have been diving into the book of Acts, and so this is where we're at today. And over the last couple weeks, we have been walking with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. And so they started in Antioch of Syria, all the way on that side, and uh, they were there in the church. They were fasting, they were praying, they were worshiping the Lord. And at that time, the Holy Spirit fell down upon the congregation and said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have planned for them. And so then the church laid hands on them, prayed for them, they fasted some more, they worshipped some more, and then the church sent them out. And they decided to go to Barnabas' home. He's from the island of Cyprus, so they went to Seleucia, grabbed a boat, rowed over to Salamis, which is the port city on Cyprus, preached the gospel in the synagogue. That tends to be a, a typical thing that they do on their missionary journeys. They go into the synagogue because it's a public place. They can meet a lot of people, a lot of Jews and Gentiles. And so they preached the gospel over the whole island, made their way to Paphos, and then they sailed up to Perga. And Perga is where John Mark abandoned them. So now it's just Barnabas and Saul. It's just Paul and Barnabas at that point. Um, John Mark abandons them, goes back to Jerusalem. He goes back home. But they know that more people need to hear the truth. They know that more people need to hear the gospel. And so they go north. They go up to Antioch in Pisidia. And so, yes, same name but two different places. We do this as well, like we talked about last week. There's probably several butlers in the United States. Um, but that was Antioch, Syria, where they started. And now they're in Antioch in Pisidia. And so that's where we left off with this passage. And so last week, we saw that they, they waited till the Sabbath day, and they went into the synagogue. So that would have been Saturday. They went into the synagogue, and when they came in, they were probably meeting and greeting with people. And somehow somebody got word that Paul was from Tarsus, and that he had trained under Gamaliel, most likely, and that he was a rabbi, and he had been trained in the Old Testament. He was educated in Jewish law, so he knew what he was talking about. He was a rabbi. And so at the end, after they read from the law and the prophets, they read from Scripture, the rulers of the synagogue said, Paul, Barnabas, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, stand up and say it, because we want to hear it. And so Paul, making the most of that opportunity, that's the opportunity that every pastor craves for when people ask you to share the gospel with them, um, he stands up and motioning with his hands, he says, men of Israel and you who fear God. So we have two groups of people here. We have Jews, men of Israel, and you who fear God, the Gentiles. Gentiles, just non-Jewish, so it's everyone else. So we have two groups of people here. And he starts by telling them the background of Israel. So out of the whole world a long time ago, God chose one man named Abraham. He picked him out of everyone else in all the nations. He, he picked Abraham up and said, I'm choosing you, and I'm going to, through your descendants, I'm going to bring about the Savior, who's going to bless all the families of the world. And after a few generations, God led the descendants of Abraham into the land of Egypt, where they would be oppressed, mistreated. They would go through the Prince of Egypt type bondage that they were in. Deliver us, you know, just all the singing. Uh, God heard their cry and delivered them. He raised up Moses, brought them out into the wilderness. They went to Mount Sinai. God gave them the law, but they rebelled against him. And so then they were judged for 40 years. They had to wander in the wilderness until the entire generation died off. And so that the new generation, the next generation, would enter into the promised land. And during that time, you have a a big group of people with no established government. So God gave them judges to save them from their enemies, but also to lead the people. And then, after a long time, Israel wanted to be like every other nation. They, they saw all the other nations, Babylon, Persia, Egypt, Assyria, all these other nations, they have kings. We want a king. We don't want judges anymore. We don't want prophets anymore. We want a king. And so God gave them a king, specifically the king that they were looking for. They looked at the outward appearance. So he gave them Saul because he was taller than the rest. He was stronger than the rest. He was the guy they were looking for. But Saul was a terrible king, did not seek the Lord. And 
ruined the people of Israel, set them on a wrong path. So God gave them a different king. He removed Saul from office and put in David. And after all of this time, you would think one of these guys has to be the savior that was promised all the way back in the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve sinned. God came down from heaven and pursued mankind and said, I'm going to send a savior for all of you. Not just one people group, not just one language, not just one race, not just one gender. I'm coming for all of you. And so you have to imagine, okay, is it, is it Abraham? No. Abraham failed over and over again. His life really isn't that good if we looked at it. He is a man of faith, but he had problems. Then we have Moses. Moses was the great leader. He was the savior type figure, but he couldn't enter the promised land because he rejected God. He hit the rock when God said, speak to it. He disobeyed the Lord. So Moses failed. Then we have the judges, imperfect people. You would think one of them would be the deliverer that we were waiting for, but they were imperfect. Then we have the kings. Saul failed, obviously. But then we have David, the man after God's own heart. If anyone's going to do it, if anyone's going to be able to save us, it's going to be David. But then David had an affair with some guy's wife. David had that guy murdered. David lied. And just a whole bunch of sins unraveled in his life. And David wasn't the guy. He couldn't do it. But then Paul says, it was through David's line, the line of the kings, that God sent the Savior. This is the guy that the Old Testament has been talking about. The whole time. This is the guy that Israel, that we have been waiting for, for thousands of years. He has come onto the scene. He has given his life as a sacrifice on the cross for our sins. And he's risen from the dead. People buried in graves don't rise from the dead. But this guy did, Jesus. And that's his name. And so Paul and Barnabas are on their first missionary journey. They want to tell the world. And so last week, they went into the synagogue. Paul said the gospel. He brought it up to Jesus And at the very end, when they're walking outside, the people begged that these saints might be told them the next Sabbath. They wanted to know, who are these two outsiders that just came into the Sabbath? And they want to know, who's this man you call Jesus? We want to know more about him, especially because you're saying that he's, he's the Messiah. He's the Savior. And so they begged that these things would be told the next Sabbath. And so then what we read about today, they come back the next Sabbath. Paul and Barnabas stayed in the area. They're there at the synagogue, and almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. These people had invited their friends and their co-workers and their family, and it stirred up the city. It stirred up the city. So let's go ahead and read, starting in verse 44 of chapter 13. It says, The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Now at Iconium... They entered, in to, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lycaonia and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Almost the whole city came to hear the news 
apparently the Savior was here. Paul and Barnabas are teaching that, and so they wanted to come. And this verse, verse 44, demands a heart check among the religious leaders and God's people. It demands a heart check because what we see in verse 45, it says, But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And we have to check our hearts and ask ourselves this question, do we really seek God's glory or do we seek our own glory? And so this wasn't the only synagogue in Antioch and Pisidia. There were many synagogues. Excavators know that. There were many synagogues. And so what would have likely happened was that you have one synagogue that there's crowds of people. I mean, not everybody could fit in the building. So there's crowds of people if almost the whole city is there. But that means that other synagogues were empty. And so we have to think about this in, in our day and age. When there's other churches in the city and around us, where does our heart lie? What are our priorities? Do we seek God's glory above our own? And we have to ask ourselves that question. And they had to as well. And the fact that they were jealous and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul shows that they were not seeking God's glory. They were seeking their own. You probably have other religious leaders in the other synagogues jealous because they've never seen crowds this big. No one's ever come to see them in this uh, awesome, uh, whatever, just crowd of people. But the point is that it's not about us. It is about Jesus Christ. It's about making him famous in all the world. It is not about the preacher. It's not about the pastor. It's not about anyone in this room. It is about Jesus Christ. We're here to make him famous in all the world. And that's what Paul and Barnabas were seeking to do. So this passage demands us, especially leaders, to check our hearts to see what we really care about and where our priorities are. Verse 46, Paul says, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. What does that mean? Well, first to you, because all since Paul started, he gave the background of Israel. He started with Abraham, which basically started the line of Israel. And so Paul's saying the Messiah, the Savior, was promised to your line. It was promised to the nation of Israel. Jesus was a Jew. He was an Israelite by birth. Like He came specifically for this group of people. So you need to hear it first. Yes, he came for the whole world, came for all nations, regardless of of people. He came for everybody, but he was an Israelite. He did specifically come to Israel. And so Paul says it was necessary to, to, to preach it to you. We want you to hear of it first because he came to you. This is the guy that we've been waiting for thousands of years. The whole Old Testament was pointing towards. He's here. You need to hear about it. And so this, when we get into other passages in the New Testament, uh, specifically Romans 1, 16, when Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So that's what that means. When you see to the Jew first and also to the Greek, it means that the Savior came for the Jews. They need to hear about it, but also to the Greek, be everyone else, because Jesus came for the whole world. Um, and so that's kind of where he starts his message. But it goes on to say, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles, obviously, everyone else rejoices at this. Yes, finally, we don't have to become Israelites. We don't have to assimilate ourselves into the Jewish culture. We can be who we are. We still have to turn from sin and turn to Christ, but we can maintain our cultural identity. We can be from where we're from. But notice it says, judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. And I want to ask you if you know anybody who has done that before, if you've heard someone do that before. And I have three different examples. First, those who reject because they think they are too bad for God to save. Those who reject because they think they're too bad for God to save. Paul says that he was the chief of sinners. He went into Damascus with papers from Jerusalem saying that he could arrest anybody belonging to the way, anybody claiming to be a Christian, he could arrest them. And he went around killing Christians. And so he said, I'm the chief of sinners. If God can save me, God can save anybody. We have plenty of other examples throughout Scripture and life that there is no one in this world that is completely hopeless. 
God is offering salvation to all people. We're all born into sin. We're all born enemies of the truth and enemies of the cross and enemies of God. But he extends salvation to all of us. So no one is too bad for God to save. Second, those who reject because they refuse to believe Christ's work is enough. See, oftentimes you, you, you hear of these religions and these cults that, that they, they'll put Christ in and they'll kind of tack him on to their belief system. But we do this too sometimes. But it just it can't be enough. I have to do something else. I have to be baptized. I have to give to charity. I have to pray. I have to do all of these different things. Be born in the right family. Go to church. All of these other things. We tend to do this. Um, and those who reject because they refuse to believe Christ's work is enough will miss out due to their own pride and rejection. It's not about our good works. They are good things, but they will never earn us a right relationship with God. Only Jesus' work on the cross will do that. Third, those who reject because they believe they don't need Jesus. And that's who we're talking about here today. These people believe they don't need Jesus and they don't even want him. So we have those three groups of people. But the point of the gospel is that no one is worthy of eternal life. No one can earn eternal life. And so we see either Christ is judged on our behalf or we are judged on our behalf. And so in, in the end, on the last day, on the judgment day, either God is going to, when he looks at us, he's going to see Jesus and his righteousness and his work and his person, or he's going to see us over here. And if we're standing by ourselves, trusting in our own works, trusting in our own righteousness, trusting in our own ways, we are condemned. But if we're standing in his righteousness, who he is and what he's done, we're saved. That is the difference. Verse 47 goes on. Paul says, For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, and he quotes Isaiah 49, 6, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. There are um, many different kinds of lights in the world. They're all designed for different purposes. They all have the same purpose to to light things up, but they're, they're designed for different things. And let me illustrate that for a second. Night lights are used to comfort children in the dark. Black lights are used by forensic scientists to view the crime scene from a different perspective. Traffic lights are used to direct traffic. Red means stop, green means go, yellow means go faster. Um, but there is always a reason for how lights are designed. And they always meet their purpose. Otherwise, they wouldn't be designed that way. And so when Paul says, or when God says that I've made Israel as a light to the nations, I've made Jesus, or he didn't make Jesus, Jesus came as a light to the nations. And then he specifically set uh, Paul and the apostles and the, uh, do people believe because they are chosen or are they chosen because they believe? That's the question that we have. And, and we can go to the book of John, which is probably the most election-focused book in the entire Bible. Jesus talks about how anything the Father has, he gives it to me, and I'll never lose it. And so we, we, we see the election verses, but we have to remember three things. First, the context. Acts is the only book in the Bible where Old Testament saints crossed over and lived into the New Testament. So if Jesus Christ on the cross is the dividing line of history, everything before this, is Old Testament. So all of this is Old Testament. All right? Genuine believers over here, we refer to them as Old Testament saints. They're Old Testament saints. Everything after this is New Testament. So you and I were called Christians, but New Testament saints. All right? Well, this was the only time in history, and it will always be the only time in history, when you have Old Testament saints living into the New Testament. And so we have to remember that. This is a transitionary period. The disciples, Peter, James, and John, they were Old Testament saints, but they moved on into the New Testament. So this is a transitionary book. Second, we have to remember that salvation has always been a free gift to all who place their faith in the Savior. And if you are saved, you cannot become unsaved. So if someone is an Old Testament saint over here, and and Jesus comes, and they hear about Jesus, they're not going to be... They're not going to stop believing. They're going to continue believing 
because they've always believed. So God is what we learn about in John. They were of the Father, and he gave them to Jesus. And so they continued believing. That's what we see in the book of John. Third, many of the Jews fell prey to the same lie that many of us fall into today, that we are somehow good with God, either because we have done the right things or grew up in the right household. It's not about your parents' faith. It's not about where you went to church. It's not about any of that, not your national identity. It is about Jesus Christ on the cross, dying for our sins, rising again, offering that life to us, and we have to make a personal decision, an individual decision to trust in him. The word appointed here, as many were appointed to eternal life believed, the word appointed in this passage, yes, means to have been decided on beforehand, assigned or set aside for a specific purpose. So God had appointed them for eternal life. They didn't appoint themselves. I know this sounds a little bit technical, but we'll get there in one second. But who are we talking to? Sounds like we're just talking about the Gentiles because they heard, they rejoiced, and, and, and they praised the word of the Lord. And then it says, and as many were appointed to eternal life believed. But back in Acts 13, verse 16, Paul stands up. This is the beginning of his sermon that he gave last week. Paul stands up and says, Men of Israel and you fear God. So we have the two groups of people, Jews and Gentiles, both in this synagogue, hearing the word. Then in Acts chapter, uh, 13, verse 42, as they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. People who hate God's word don't beg for more of God's word. That's just not something that they naturally do. But people who are genuine believers do that's typically what we see in life so we're talking about jews and gentiles and in john 6 37 it says jesus is talking all that the father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me i will never cast out for i have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me and this is the will of him who sent me that i should lose nothing of all that he has given me But raise it up on the last day, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And then in verse 45 it says, It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So everyone who is truly listening to God was coming to Jesus. So this is what we see in John. John 10 14 through 16 says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. And now it's possible that that part of that is Jesus looking ahead into the future and seeing people like us. I have other sheep not of this fold. But that is a present reality to him 2,000 years ago. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. So he's looking over the crowds of Israel and saying, I have a lot of sheep in this fold. But in Antioch and Pisidia, I have other sheep who are not of this fold, Gentiles. So what we see in Antioch and Pisidia is that these people were already saved. They were Old Testament saints. That now, upon hearing the good news of Jesus Christ, they're continuing to believe. They're passing into the New Testament. And so that's the transition that we're seeing. So, how does election work? This is the big, this is the big question. Ephesians 1, verse 4 says, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love... He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. That verse does not sound the way. They kept calling on the intercom. I, they had already boarded. But they were calling all of these people. There's just a list of names that I guess they had the roster of who should be on the plane, but these people weren't there yet. And so they're, they're calling out and five or six times, I don't know, but like, and then they got to the point, this is your final call. Like, this is your last chance to get on the plane because we have to maintain schedule. But they're calling out to people. 
And so I think about that in terms of the church. The church is that airplane. We are calling out. The Spirit is calling out to the world. Come in. Be a part of what God's doing. Believe in Jesus. You'll be part of the church and you'll be saved. You'll reach the destination. But if you don't come into the church, you will be lost. So God has elected the church to be the rescue ship. And it says the Gentiles, uh, you know, they rejoiced when they heard this. They glorified God. This should have been Israel's response. The Messiah is here. Yes, praise the Lord. But they didn't have that response. Instead, they hated him. They murdered him. They put him on a cross. And yet you see the Gentiles who had nothing to do with Israel, they're the ones receiving the word of God gladly and joyfully. And this just shows us that God's word will never come back void. God's word will never come back void. And that's the first blank on your bulletin. God's word will never come back void. And this is a promise from Isaiah 55:11. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and I shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God's word never comes back void. So when we preach the word, we should always do it having an expectation of victory. Because God's word will never come back void. God has designed the light of the gospel to reach the Gentiles, and it will do just that. It will accomplish that purpose and that mission. Verse 50 says, But the Jews incited the devout women. So now this is the contrast. This is after the fact. The Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and drove them out of their district. Not just out of the city, but out of the whole region. You have to get out of here. But you notice there's a progression in the persecution. It started as verbal abuse, hate speech, gossip, slander, contradicting but now it's political manipulation you're going to the authorities and this in our culture is what we've transitioned into because to incite is to encourage or stir up violent or unlawful behavior the persecution is growing in our country and we're not at the last step which we'll talk about in a minute but but it's it's continuing to increase we're transitioning out of just verbal abuse to now unlawful behavior that's where we're going as a culture. And that's what they do. The Jews incited the devout women. They went to the women who had great influence in the synagogues. They went to the, the leading men of the city. They went for political power to manipulate, to coerce, to force the political leaders to do something about this, to cast them out of the region. And then it says, verse 51, but they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit shaking the dust off your feet uh, it's kind of weird to us we wear shoes we don't have a lot of dirt roads um, that we walk on today but back then they were all dirt roads uh, some rock roads but they wore sandals so their feet got really dirty and Jesus said in John where oh no Luke 10 sorry about that Luke 10 10 through 12 But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into the streets and say, even the dust of your own town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed all the way back at Genesis when uh, homosexuality was rampant, sexual sin was rampant. Uh, They didn't care for the poor. They didn't care for anybody, actually. They didn't ever look to someone else's needs. They always just looked at themselves. And almost the whole city of men came to Lot's house because he had two visitors, and they came at night to rape those two visitors in the streets. That's how bad Sodom was. And so God destroyed Sodom, leveled it. And yet Jesus says that the town that the word of God comes to and rejects that word, is worse than Sodom. It will be more bearable for Sodom on that day than it will be for that town. Why? Because Sodom didn't get a prophet. Sodom didn't get a preacher. There were no missionaries sent to Sodom. But there have been to these places. 
And it's not all bad. Uh, as we see, the disciples were, were joy. They were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. One of the reasons why they were filled with joy was probably because there were people who believed. That brings great joy to people whenever there's a success to your mission, whenever you preach the gospel and people believe. That brings joy. But that's a good question. Why were, we joy- why were they joyful? Because to an unbeliever, suffering, persecution, um, there's no joy in it. You just kind of have to endure it. It's, it's just life. There's no point to it. But for a believer, persecution, suffering shows us many things. shows us that we're doing something right because it's confirming that what we're doing is godly. Uh, people believe the message. That's joyful. We are being made like Jesus and his suffering. And ultimately, they were filled with joy because God himself was with them. If you think back, reaction caused a reaction from, from these people. Either you believe or you disbelieve. Uh, but it always demands a response on our part. We have to make a personal decision to follow the Lord or to not follow him. So the word of God will never come back void. The word of God will always cause a reaction, and the word of God will forever continue to increase. The word of God will forever continue to increase. Again, they, 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 they run away from the city. They were driven out. They go to Iconium. They're, um, if you follow the arrow, they go to Iconium. And at Iconium, they enter the Jewish synagogue. See, Paul just said, you know, we're turning away from the Jews. We're, we're going to the Gentiles. But Paul had, uh, we know from the rest of Scripture, Paul had uh, a great struggle with leaving the Jewish people. He always had hope for them. He, he knew that God still had a plan for them. And so he never wanted to completely forsake them. But he did change his target audience. But in this case, he went to a Jewish synagogue to preach the gospel. And many believed, but the unbelieving Jews poisoned the people's minds against them. And so Paul and Barnabas stayed for a long time, probably trying to fix their reputation a little bit, um, but also to disciple those who believed. Satan does not want you to believe this message. The world doesn't want you to believe this message. They say, believe any other message, just not this one, not the word of God. You see, the, wor- the, the world really has no problem with you believing in Islam. The world has no problem with you being a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness. Yeah, we might not open the door. We don't have a whole lot of problems. But when it comes to Christianity, when it comes to the Word of God, suddenly there's a big problem. They do not want people to believe this message. So Paul and Barnabas stayed a long time teaching, even with signs and wonders coming from their hands, authenticating the gospel message for them. And we often say, well, if, if, if God would just show us signs and wonders, work miracles, like I would believe. And maybe, maybe that's true. It's probably not true, but maybe it is. Maybe you would believe, but it's not up to us. God decides when miracles take place. And Jesus even said in the gospel accounts, blessed are those who don't see, but still believe and still trust. Because there's always, no matter what belief you hold, there's an element of faith to it. And God demands faith on our part. Started as verbal abuse, led to political manipulation, and now it's at attempted murder. They actually want to stone Paul and Barnabas. And so the persecution is escalating throughout this passage. And they end up fleeing to Lystra and Derby and into the surrounding countryside. So we see on the arrows, they flee and they continued to preach the gospel. And in Matthew 10, 23, Jesus said, when they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. Basically, don't just be a martyr. Like if you can escape a martyr's death, escape, save your life. Don't die unnecessarily. If it comes to the point where you have to be a martyr, you never deny Christ. But if you can escape, save your life. Do it. Don't just stay there. And so this is what we see. No matter what Satan or the world tries to do, what laws they legislate against the church, they won't succeed. They can't succeed. Yes, things are going to continue getting worse as we reach the departure date of the church. But they won't succeed. The gospel is still going to move forward in life. There's a, there's a radio signal that Christians in South Korea are actually sending right over the border into North Korea. 
to uh, hopefully lead more North Koreans to faith in Christ, but also to edify and encourage the believers there already. And North Korea can't stop the signal. And that's what we're talking about here. They can't stop the signal. The word of God is going to continue to be proclaimed in this place and in all over the world, Butler and beyond. It's going to keep going forward because that's what it's designed to do. It's designed to reach the nations. And so the word of God will forever continue to increase with or without you. With or without you, it will continue to increase. And the point is that the gospel can't be stopped from spreading all over the world. This is a global gospel, and this light that God has created is designed to reach all nations. And he is and will continue to do that. But have you trusted in him for the forgiveness of of your sins? Are you part of the church? Are you on the rescue ship? Because the plane is about to depart. There's probably no coincidence that the Old Testament is so big all the way to that wall up to the cross, and then the New Testament. It's just kind of small here. Oh, sorry. We're we're about, the departure date is soon. This is like one of the final calls. Believe in Christ. Don't be like the unbelieving Jews. Trust, Trust in Christ. Trust in his sacrifice alone. Not good works, not baptism, not your family not where you grew up or go to church, not your national identity, nothing else, just Jesus Christ, who he is, what he did for us on the cross. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we, um, we thank you so much for us from heaven by which we must be saved, and that's Jesus Christ. It's because of what he's done for us on the cross. He took our punishment. He died the death we deserve to die. And he rose again, defeating sin, defeating death. And he offers us new life. But we have, we have to believe in him. We have to trust in him. We have to throw ourselves upon him and hope in him and have our expectations in him alone. He and he alone can save us, nothing else. And so, God, I, I pray that you, would, that you would save people. God, that you would bring them in to your fold, that you would bring them in to your church, that they would get on the plane. And God, I, I, I pray for the rest of us, Lord, that you continue to build us up as a church, build us up as a congregation, now that you would use us to continue advancing your gospel in this world. Father, that you would use us in that way. We love you, God.